with Ref Young and Pignatelli this, um, this morning representing uh, Comcast. And I will be very brief. I know this will probably go to subcommittee and uh, with the written statement, I just want to supplement. Um, we are here in support of this piece of legislation. It's something we've worked with the Attorney General's office uh, very closely on. Um, it is, is, from our uh, standpoint, it is an expansion of the definition to include all electronic service providers. And we think that is uh, going to provide proper authorization for valid administrative subpoenas. In regard to the amendment that was added in the Senate regarding real ID, do you have a We do not, uh, do not take a position with regards to that piece. Good morning. Um, hey, please, the committee, my name is Will Delker. I am a senior assistant attorney general in the Criminal Justice Bureau of the Attorney General's Office. Is it fair to say that if uh, Real ID Act of 2005 hadn't been passed, that the AG's office would still be here because of all the changes in telecommunications making this request? Oh, absolutely. I don't think our original proposal, <coughs> um, my, what I looked at online today was that the original bill did not include the Real ID component of it. I think that that was the amendment that was added in the Senate. Um, and our office doesn't take any position on the Real ID component of it. This bill was proposed simply to address that technical change um, in the law. And, and the real idea, I don't, I mean, we're not taking a position. I'm not here to testify about that. I frankly don't want to For the record, my name is Joel Lutchins. I represent Hillsborough District 17, which is Manchester Wards 10, 11, and 12. I know we've already had uh, a couple hours of testimony on this bill, so I'll try and be brief. Um, I think you all know that I oppose the Real ID Act and that I oppose asking for an extension uh, for compliance with the Real ID Act. And when I heard that the Senate had attached an amendment to a bill that requested the governor ask for this extension, I asked myself, why wouldn't that be a non germane amendment? What kind of bill could possibly be related to the Real ID Act, which pushes a national ID card, maybe moves America a little closer to a police state, demolishes privacy and civil liberties for Americans? What kind of bill could possibly be related? So when I read Senate Bill 434, Senate, I'm firmly opposed to Senate Bill 434, um, with or without the amendment, uh, asking for an extension of real ID. In order for this information to be turned over, it has, there have to be records kept. And we've seen too many people have their credit cards, numbers stolen from TJ Maxx, from Hanford's, other places, because people were careless in storing our constituents' personal information. And what this legislation does is require even more records to be kept, even more of our constituents' personal information be kept and recorded and be accessible. And I think there's a danger to that. But overall, uh, this legislation, it just it chips away at the privacy and civil liberties and values that are so important to so many people here in New Hampshire. And I would hope that the community can find this expedient to legislate. Thank you. For the record, my name is Howard Wilson. I come here in generalized opposition to the whole of this legislation. And sadly, between Tuesday's hearing and today's hearing, it's been extremely educational. It hasn't done a lot for me, but it's been educational nonetheless. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Claire Ebel. I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union, and I am unalterably opposed to any participation in the Real ID Act of 2005. 
I am not for a moment suggesting that General Delta or General Ayotte or any of the other people in the AG's office are untrustworthy. But it is your job as legislators to be prepared for the Assistant Attorney General at some time in the future who may not be. And that is why, as legislators, you put constraints around the unfettered ability of the executive branch to act without judicial oversight. I don't mean to babble, babble Madam Chair, but this is such an important issue in terms of balancing privacy with the genuine needs of the Attorney General's office to pursue crime that all of us want pursued and all of us want the criminals caught. But if we sacrifice our privacy in the course of that conduct, we are left with a society that we won't recognize when we hand it over to our children and grandchildren. <coughs> with regard to the second part of the bill, Madam Chair, you are being asked to violate New Hampshire law if you pass Section 2 of the bill. Um, in 2007, when you almost unanimously passed the Real ID Patent Law, and the Senate did pass it unanimously, um, it was incorporated into, the, uh, into Section 263 of the, RR, the RSAs, which deal with driver's licenses. And I would just like to quote to you one section. The state of New Hampshire shall not participate in any driver's license program. It shall not amend its procedures or comply with any rules or regulations promulgated under the Real ID Act of 2005. The exception which you see, the waiver which you ask for, which is asked for in this bill, is in compliance with the rules and regulations of the Real ID Act of 2005, and therefore would be in violation of the act that you adopted in 2007. Representative uh, Palmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, uh, Ms. Ewell. It, 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 it's bothering me because I find myself in agreement with you again. And it's <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ruin you. <laughs> Um, I had a couple questions. One, as far as the real ID portion of this, if a citizen in New Hampshire still, if they keep pushing back the dates, I don't know where we're at now, but wants to comply, i.e. they have business and they want to keep taking planes, they can currently get a passport which does comply with real ID and would be, be unnecessary for New Hampshire to uh, comply with it. Is that correct? Representative Hopper, I think, it's, I think it's far more complicated than that. Um, first of all, there is no state in the union that has a, a real ID compliant license. And no state in the union is required to provide a real ID compliant license to any of its citizens until 2014. And for those of us who were born after 1960, Think. 64, I thought it was. Is it 64? I think so. um, that they will not have to comply until 2017. <coughs> and so it is a pretext, from my perspective, that Homeland Security and Mr. Chertoff are engaged in right now to say New Hampshire citizens will not be allowed to board planes based on their New Hampshire driver's license because it's not real ID compliant, because no driver's license is and doesn't have to be for another six years or nine years. And so what I think you're in now is what is called a contest, and I won't use the impolite word that usually precedes it, <laughs> um, because I think the, the uh, Homeland Security Chief is unhappy with those of us who live in states that said, Frankly, how no, we won't go to the federal government. There are now seven states that have statutorily refused to comply, and 11 states that have refused to comply by um, uh, legislative words gone. That's happening to me a lot. Resolution, thank you, Representative Chase. What a savior. And so, um, in addition, you can fly now and always could without any identification at all you simply have to submit to a secondary search. And so with our theoretically non-compliant New Hampshire licenses, we can still fly with them. 
but you submit to a warrant search. The reality of the passport is that it is an expensive device for individuals to skirt what I believe to be an unconstitutional requirement by Homeland Security to say you must have a driver compliant license by May the 11th, but you don't have to produce one until 2011 or, or 2014 or 2017. Uh, there's, there's a lawsuit there, I'm certain, uh, to suggest that how are we going to produce a compliant license if no one has one until 2014? It, the whole thing sounds to me like what my Irish grandmother used to call a tempest in a teapot. So, uh, follow up, please. Just, okay, so, but for the people, because the problem with this is I, I agree with a lot of people, I'm sure in the audience, that we should never comply with real ID. But the reality is, if all of a sudden the, uh, uh, you went to the airport <coughs> and citizens of New Hampshire could not board a plane to go do business in New York, they'd all be calling me on the phone and say, what are you a jerk and all this other stuff. They, put, they call me that anyway. But <clears throat> my question is, under, real, uh, under the, the system, regardless of when it takes place or doesn't take place, an individual in New Hampshire who wants to do business in New York and take a plane, <coughs> regardless of when anything goes gets into effect, goes into effect, could use a passport and, and skirt what uh, 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 ignore whatever New Hampshire does do. Is that correct? Representative Papa, that is correct. They can do so now. You don't right. need a state ID. You can use your passport as ID. But as I said, they can still go to New York to do business. Right, I understand. New Hampshire driver's license if they submit to a secondary search. My name is Bob Constantine, and I've lived in New Hampshire almost 50 years. I don't support warrantless searches uh, addressing the first part of the bill, nor does our state or our U.S. Constitution. I won't read them, but I would ask you to maybe jot down in the New Hampshire Constitution Articles 37 and 38, which address that. In the United States Constitution, Article 4, and I'll end on the first part, I'll simply say I think those who support the first part of Bill 434, uh, regardless of their expertise, they really don't comprehend the true intent of those articles. On the second part, concerning Real ID, uh, I'm, again I, I want to express my real concern over Real ID in any attempt by the state of New Hampshire to request an extension to comply with the federal government's <coughs> Real ID policies. We resoundingly rejected this opportunity and enacted a law stating we would not participate. In the body of the law, we found Real ID to be repugnant. That was a proud moment for me. Uh, somebody asked, um, you know, if what should I do? Uh, you know, if I get phone calls and all that. I mean. I'll tell you what I think. I think that um, this is a political game and it's a political move, and I think it's bad. Uh, you all took an oath to uphold the Constitution, not to subvert it, not to circumvent it, or not to reinterpret it, but to uphold it. And there's nobody here who didn't take that oath. So most of the answers that you see, they're already laid out. I'll close with three very good reasons to reject Real ID and any requests for an extension. I think it's an illegal and unfounded mandate. <coughs> it's also an expensive, inefficient bureaucracy that must be funded. Thomas Jefferson said, I am for a government rigorously frugal and simple. Were we directed from Washington when to sow, when to reap, we should soon want bread. The second reason, I think it's a blatant attempt to false flag and arouse phony patriotism when it really tears at the very heart of liberty. James Madison said, perhaps it is a universal truth that the loss of liberty at home is to be charged to the provision against danger, real or pretended, from abroad. 
And the last reason, the issue in New Hampshire, as has been stated, has already been decided. We've already said no thanks. We have a law that says we will not participate. So I believe it's a uh, done deal and the case is closed. So finally, I think if anyone wants to go further with Real ID, we need to call on the governor, our U.S. senators, our congressmen, and our state senators to ask and remind the federal government that not only does New Hampshire reject Real ID, but we believe the whole plan for all the states is illegal and repugnant. And to tell them they're past their enumerated powers in enacting the plan in the first place. Thank you for listening and for having the courage to uphold the oath that you all took. Dennis Goddard. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, members of the committee. I really appreciate your coming out on an off day and listening to all these people. I'll be respectful as possible of your time and I'll be very brief. I would just like to discuss three points. I'd like to discuss a little bit of technical detail concerning um, what Mr. Delker told you. I'd like to talk a little bit about the point raised by Mr. Collins um, concerning some technical issues. And lastly, I'd like to share with you a little bit of my technical expertise um, concerning the bill as a whole. So first, um, I think we all understand that Clear made it very clear that there's a difference between an emergency situation requiring immediate attention and an ongoing investigation. What I would like to point out is that absent the bomb scare and the immediate I'm going to kill you problem, if you're doing an ongoing investigation into say a drug deal or a stalker, the only kinds of people that this legislation has passed <coughs> completely as written, the only kind of people that you can protect against are the smallest fish in the pond. I'd like to help you with your crime-fighting careers. I know you don't get paid enough for this job. If you want to commit a crime and you have a phone, you go and buy a track phone at Walmart with cash. I don't care who subpoenas what, you're not going to find any information about me, period, in the story. Okay? If we want to say that cash is going to be illegal, let that be a separate issue. Uh, on a similar point, you talked a little bit about dynamic IP addresses and, and driving by a... Uh, a Dunkin' Donuts. I'm sure most of you are aware, especially if you live in a larger city, there are things called open Wi-Fi access points. Just open up your laptop, click on wireless connections, and you'll see probably at least one or two with names that are the default issued by the manufacturer, like Belkin or Linksys or Netgear, that you can just go ahead and connect to. The person who owns that Wi-Fi router box had no idea you're connected. Their ISP is giving you an IP address. They have no idea who you are and no way of tracking who you are. This gets into Representative Harvey's question about my brother-in-law. It's not only the fact that you can't choose your family, you even less can choose your in-laws, but you really can't choose who happens to be within about a 100-yard radius of your house and might be using your internet connection unless you're particularly technically savvy you probably don't know how to close up your wireless Wi-Fi and then not have to protect yourself and prove your innocence against someone who may be committing a crime. One other point with respect to Mr. Delker's testimony I would refer you to Part 1, Article 8 of the New Hampshire Constitution. Um, I think we all have this weird, vague sense that there's something wrong with getting complete immunity to someone who might be giving up our records and I would just point out that all power residing originally in being derived from the people and all magistrates and officers of government are their substitutes and agents and at all times accountable to them. I would propose to you that if we pass legislation that requires internet service providers to hand over my information, those people in effect become the substitute and agent of the government. And the Constitution requires that they be accountable. But that's not the real meat of, of, of this issue. The real, real meat, if we cut through all the technical baloney, <clears throat> what we have here is an extremely large corporation in conjunction with the executive branch of government lobbying you to seed up some of the people's liberty. Part 1, Article 3 makes it very, very clear in the New Hampshire Constitution that the reason that we have a government is that we give up some of our liberties in order to get back some protection. It also makes it clear that where that protection is not given, the contract is null and void. 
So you've heard from the executive that they'd like some of our liberty. You've heard from a large corporation that they'd be easy fine for them to give up some of our liberty. But I will pose to you that what you're going to hear from every other person who comes and sits here before you, who is in fact one of the people or their elected representative, they're asking you to please preserve our liberty. This is what you are hearing overwhelmingly. I don't believe there's a single person that's going to come to you and say, I want you to make me a little safer. I want you to give me more protection and give up some of that liberty. You're not going to hear that. I'll just go on with it to make that prediction. <coughs> Uh, my second point, which will be even briefer, we heard from Senator Janeway and we heard from Mr. Collins that Comcast Corporation is absolutely fine and dandy and can handle whatever requirements are laid out in this, in this bill. Well, of course. Um, those of you who are big fans of Milton Friedman as I am, um, even if you're not a big fan and haven't read his scholarly stuff, if you read uh, Free to Choose, which he co-authored with his wife Rose, fantastic book, describes this process that happens over and over and over again. There is a public problem. There is a danger you're being asked to solve the problem because your legislators are not technical experts in general. You go to industry to find out how best they should be regulated. Industry tells you how they should be regulated. And what that does is entrenches the ability of the large organizations, the large corporations currently in business, probably not intentionally, they know how to police themselves and they can, but it makes it extremely difficult for small, agile companies that are just starting out to be able to provide products and services that customers might want. Let me give you an example. Comcast is pointing out that this voice over IP thing is new. It's not new. Man, that is so two years ago. Okay, for people in the IP industry, if you don't have voice over IP now, I mean, you're wearing the wrong kind of suit, baby. Things like IP television on mobile app handsets are a little bit hot now, although that's so old that even I've heard of it. Okay, and I'm not getting a hip anymore. Comcast doesn't provide IP television services. Personally, I, by the way, I do subscribe to Comcast. I'm not saying they're evil. They give me a really good rate. Um, but Comcast is not in the business of providing mobile MP3s, mobile television access, mobile geolocation services, all kinds of other things that we might like to do. Those are really being staked out by small companies in places like Silicon Valley. I have friends involved in some of these start companies who are not paying me to be here. Although it would be nice if they did. These kind of companies aren't in a position to be able to go through the extra work it would be required to to comply with this kind of legislation. They're not here because they don't even know what's going on because they don't have a legal team keeping track of these things. So the fact that Comcast is here at telling you that this is fine and dandy doesn't mean that the industry is here telling you that this is fine and dandy. What that means is the small guys, the startups, are probably going to be hurt. Lastly, um, something that touches both aspects, the first and second parts of the business, <coughs> As it turns out, in my professional life, I have a, a perspective on this legislation that is probably quite unique to individuals in Concord, maybe even to individuals in my state. Uh, I am a senior development manager at the largest database corporation in the world. I guarantee there is information in a database manufactured by my company on every single person in the room. Okay? Now, I have two pieces of information to tell you about large databases that any software engineer is going to be able to cooperate, uh, corroborate for you. Point number one, all software has bugs. I have a team of people that work in different time zones around the world so they can fix bugs 24-7, 365. It's really cool. We have people in India who are not Christian. They can work on, on Christmas. We have, you know, People in other places that are Hindu that work on the Bali and it, it all works out great. They fix bugs all day, every day. Bugs, bugs in databases, bugs that cause corruption, bugs that cause people to be able to snatch things out of the database without you knowing it. That's just the deal. That's part of software. Number two, human beings occasionally make mistakes. And they will with the data that is recorded in these databases. So for all of the reasons listed above, I ask you, not to amend this bill to make it better, not to maybe shore up some of our liberties. None of the
people who are here before you, or their elected representatives who are before you, are really asking you, please shore up this piece and put a little extra lock on it. To, you're being asked overwhelmingly to ITL this legislation. That is what the people are asking you for. Thank you. Again, I don't presume to speak for all the citizens of New Hampshire, but what I hear <coughs> from other people sitting in this chair is that this should be ITO, and it would be great for some new piece of legislation whose clear intended purpose is rolling back some of the powers that the AG currently enjoys. Thank you. Please, if there was one thing that I would ask of my government, please stop protecting me. At this time, I will close the public hearing on Senate Bill 434.